once again to all the wonderful devotees who are kindly present here today and who wish to listen to this discussion on Sri Upadeshamritam of Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada. This is a detailed study and therefore we are trying to dive in to the verses of Upadeshamritam as much as possible. Before we begin our session, I usually commence with a verse offered to Srila Rupa Goswami. I once again offer it to him. Shudhyartham mama dehasya jalasnanam karomyaham Shri Rupa Vak Sudhasnanam Swatmanaha Parishuddhaye for the purification of my physical body, I bathe regularly using water. For the thorough purification of my soul, however, I bathe in the nectar of the words of Srila Rupa Goswami. So Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada is someone whose words have the capability of purifying each and every day, each and every hour, and each and every moment of our existence. And the wonderful thing about Srila Rupa Goswami is that he is truly an Acharya who practices what he teaches. Srila Rupa Goswami is teaching us Vacho Vegam. And when we see the words of Sri Rupa Goswami, we see how pleasing they are and how loving, how gentle, how in a fatherly mood he is instructing all of us followers. And I had asked in the previous session, what image do we have of Srila Rupa Goswami in our minds? And most certainly the image of Srila Rupa Goswami that most devotees have in their mind is of a personality who is Dhira Adhira Janapriya. He is dear not only to the dhiras, to the sober people, but also to the adhiras, those who are not so sober. So, Srila Rupa Goswami is a very loving personality who instructs in a most merciful manner. If we read through the entire literature composed by Srila Rupa Goswami, we will be hard pressed to find a single criticism of any personality. It will be very difficult to find a single word of criticism directed against a particular personality. Srila Rupa Goswami's speech is definitely a personification of what he has himself taught about good speech. And there is a very nice Sanskrit verse regarding such good, pleasing speech. So this verse describes what is the importance of speaking sweet words. And this verse is as follows. Priyavakya pradhanena sarve tushyanti jantavaha tasmata deva vaktavyam vachane kadaridrata Priyavakya pradhanena by speaking Priyavakya by speaking sweet words. Tushyanti. You know, everyone is satisfied. Survey. Everyone. Jantava. All living entities are satisfied. It's a fact. You can think about it. By speaking sweet words, all living entities are satisfied. Tasmat. Therefore, Tadeva Bhaktavyam. Try to speak only sweet words as much as possible. Vachane ka daridrata. Do you become poor by speaking words? sweet words. Fortunately, till now, the government is not taxing sweet words, dear devotees. So you have an unlimited supply of sweet words with you and the government is not taxing it. Dhameshwar Prabhu, is the American government putting a tax on sweet words? No tax, Prabhu. No tax. So the no words is ka daridrata. What is the poverty? Do you become poor by speaking sweet words? Absolutely not. So therefore, 
speak only sweet words. So here is the translation. By speaking sweet words, all living entities are certainly satisfied. Therefore, one must speak sweetly. Why exhibit poverty in speaking sweet words? In the previous session, we were speaking about a verse which Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur had indirectly pointed to. <clears throat> Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur did not directly point to this verse of the Bhagavad Gita, but we made a connection because he used a term which was common with that verse in the Bhagavad Gita. He used the term Anudvega. And using this term, we made that connection to that verse of Bhagavad Gita, which defined austerity of speech. Anudvega karam vakyam satyam priyahitam chayat swadhyaya bhyasanam chayva vangmayam tapa ucchete. So devotees who were present in the previous session, they had seen the verse where the qualities of vakyam or speech were listed. So Shri Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, he gives four qualities of vakyam or speech. So the first quality he says is an karam, that our speech should not cause agitation to the listener. This is ideal speech. Second is satyam, it should be truthful. Third is priyam, it should be pleasing to the ears. It should not be criticism, harsh criticism. And fourth is hitam. So just because it is pleasing, we should not try to harm the listener by speaking some sweet lies. Or we should not speak in a way which although may be priyam, pleasing, but is non-beneficial to the listener. So in this way, these were the four qualities of vakyam or speech. And Krishna said, if these four are not possible, then swadhyaya abhyasanam. At least try to ensure that you engage in study of the Vedas. Because that is self-study. Self-study, you are not speaking to anyone else. You are speaking to yourself. So swadhyaya. Engage in swadhyaya if nothing else. Engage in self-study of the Vedas, of the Shastras. So these were the four qualities of vakyam or speech listed in the Bhagavad Gita, 17th chapter, verse number 15. Now, let's try to analyze what will happen if these four qualities are not ensured. So, like in the previous session, Dhameshwar Prabhu, I made you the via medium of speaking to everyone. So, is it okay if in this talk to, I make you the via medium of speaking to everyone? Yes, Prabhuji. Okay, thank you. So, Dhameshwar Prabhu, what is the harm in agitating other people? You know, from time to time, it is our duty to speak in a way which agitates other people. And especially if those people are wrong, then we should definitely agitate them. What is the harm in agitating them? Please tell me, Prabhu. Agitating for other people for their own sake is different from agitating them for their ultimate benefit. I would make an argument from empathy that just like I don't want to be agitated, I shouldn't agitate other people. Very nice. So your argument is that I should not treat others the same way that I do not wish to be treated myself. And yes. that's a very good argument. Because... If we ourselves do not like to be agitated, then we also should try not to agitate others. Some people have a habit of agitating other people on purpose and then they consider it to be some sort of a service, either to the society or either to Bhagavan Shri Krishna. So this, if we do not ensure that our speech is uh, karam, then something will happen. In the Mahabharat, Sri Vidur, he says this to Dhritarashtra and he says, what happens if speech causes agitation always to the listeners? So Vidur says, 
अभ्यावहति कल्याणम विविधम वाक सुभाषिता सैव दुर्भाषिता राजन अनर्थायोपकल्पते रोहते साय कैर्विधम वनम परशुनाहतम वाचा दुरुक्तम बीभत्सम न समोहति वाक्षतम अभ्यावहति कल्याणम विविधम वाक सुभाषिता उद्रितराष्ट्र स्पीच दैट इज प्लेजेंट सुभाषिता वाक इट कैरी इज अ वराइटी ऑफ ऑस्पिशियसनेस विद इट अभ्यावहति कल्याणम इट कैरी इज कल्याणम ऑस्पिशियसनेस विद इट बट सई व दुर्भाषिता इफ द सेम स्पीच इज अनप्लेजेंट राजन उद्रितराष्ट्र अनर्थाय उपकल्पते देन इट लीड्स टू इमेन्स इन ऑस्पिशियसनेस देन ही एक्सप्लेन्स विद एन एग्जाम्पल रोहते साय कैर विधम वनम परशुना हतम a forest which is cut down by piercing arrows or sharp axes can heal and grow back in time but vacha duruktam bibhatsam na samrohati vaksha but a brutal wound caused by unpleasant speech can never be healed and the mahabharat itself is going to become an example of this because when shri krishna himself went as a messenger of peace to ensure a settlement between the kauravas and the pandavas the final settlement that shri krishna suggested is that the pandava should be given five villages so that every brother will have at least one village to rule over and at that point of time duryodhan could have agreed and said okay at least i will give five villages because these are kshatriyas they need some land of their own but instead duryodhan ended up saying in a very harsh tone that i will not even give that much area of land in which the a needle can prick so i will not give even that much land to the pandavas so this caused such hurt in the pandavas that it led to the mahabharat war if duryodhan would have said yes i am willing to give five villages then it would have stopped right there and then not only did duryodhan not stop there Duryodhan also insulted Krishna right there and then, and then Shri Krishna had to show Duryodhan his power in the assembly itself. So Duryodhan had ordered Shri Krishna to be arrested, and at that point of time, Krishna had to show his Virat Roop, which nobody can arrest. So this is the effect of Udveg Karam Vakyam or speech. which causes agitation in others so this is a verse by vidur himself who is considered to be very learned in niti shastra very learned in how to behave in the society so we should all learn from this verse that what is the result of speaking words which agitate others we may speak the truth but in the end people will never forget how they were treated by us moving ahead the second quality was satyam that we should speak what is the truth dhameshwar prabhu what is the harm in speaking lies you may get some temporary advantage selfishly but you're unable to have trusting relationships and without that you really can't get far in life or be happy very nice so a person who is a habitual liar will not be able to have anyone who can trust him or her not only that such a person becomes a burden on planet earth itself these are not my words these are the words of planet earth mother earth herself in the shrimad bhagavatam mother earth speaks a verse and this verse is as follows सत्यात्परो धर्म होवाच भूरि सर्व सोढ़ुम अलम मे ऋते लीक परम नरम न हि असत्यात्परो अधर्म शी सेज देर इज नथिंग मोर सिंफुल दैन अनट्रुथफुलनेस इच भूरि बिकॉज ऑफ दिस मदर अर्थ वन सेड सर्व सोढ़ुम अलम मे आई कैन बेर एनी हेवी थिंग ऋते एक्सेप्ट अलीक परम नरम a person who is a liar it's a very strong quote directly from the shrimad bhagavatam that those who are liars are basically 
big burden upon planet earth therefore the vedas also say satyam vada speak the truth now dameshwar prabhu is it practically possible to always keep speaking the truth not in all circumstances i don't think it would be ideal no, not in all circumstances otherwise we'll come close to maharaj yudhishthir standard and it's very difficult to maintain that standard in today's age so researchers have found out that an average person speaks anywhere between 0 to 2 lies every day on average so it is very difficult to fulfill this condition and not only us ordinary souls but even the acharyas on some occasions have indulged in speaking lies so dhameshwar prabhu can you give an example from the personal life of any acharya maybe you can try to think of some example where the acharya has engaged in speaking outright lies the first example that comes to mind is um when krishna told you to steer to lie right okay that we can say is krishna's direct order but you know some acharya who without any higher instruction just spoke a lie i can't so, think of anything yes there is an example in the chaitanya charitamrita where sanatan goswami ended up speaking a lie because shri sanatan goswami he was working for the government and the government was nawab hussein shah's government and sanatan goswami was tired of his job and sanatan goswami wanted a permanent break but he did not want to offend the king so sanatan goswami told nawab hussein shah that i want to go on a sick leave so sanat sanatan goswami was granted a sick leave and sanatan goswami on the pretext of taking a sick leave was studying shrimad bhagavatam so dhameshwar prabhu is that a very good idea of lying to your boss and then studying shrimad bhagavatam on the pretext of a sick leave <laughs> prabhuji uh, um i wouldn't do it but i'm not on that level so i i don't want to speak for sanatan goswami okay but do you agree at least that he spoke a lie to nawab hussein shah yes yes definitely so <clears throat> sometimes even acharyas have indulged in speaking what is not the truth so if acharyas also sometimes speak like that then how can we decide you know whether we should speak the truth or we should not speak the truth so in this regard there is a conclusion given in the bhakti sandarbha shrila jiva goswami says this so shrila jiva goswami says he quotes a verse from the padma puran man nimittam kritam paapam apikshemaya kalpate mamana dritya dharmo pi paapam syan mat prabhavatah man nimittam kritam paapam krishna is saying sins committed for my sake api kshemaya kalpate lead to one's benefit whereas mam anadritya dharmo pi any so called religiosity done at the cost of neglecting me papam syan mat prabhavat results in sin by my influence so the general rule established by the previous acharyas which not only applies to sanatan goswami but to each and every devotee is that if they sometimes speak a lie not habitually but sometimes if they speak a lie but for the sake of advancement in their krishna bhakti then by the direct words of bhagwan shri krishna it leads to their benefit and doesn't lead to any negative reaction whereas if they indulge in speaking that truth which neglects shri krishna or which neglects bhakti then it may ultimately lead to a dharma so therefore by this particular verse it is established that sometimes for the sake of advancement in one's personal bhajan so sometimes not every time for the sake of advancement of one's personal bhajan 
a devotee may speak a lie. So this is the reason why Sri Sanatan Goswami spoke a lie to Nawab Hussain Shah. And <clears throat> other than this, a devotee should try to be truthful as far as possible in their day-to-day -day speech. Now, sometimes it is impossible for some devotees to do this because some devotees are engaged in business. And in business, you have to sell things. And in selling things, it is the nature of business that you have to speak a lot of lies. So some devotees are lawyers. So those who are lawyers, they can understand that it is very difficult to apply this condition of speaking only the truth. Therefore, we have to find some way out. And I'll specify how to find a way out of this, especially if we are not able to speak the truth every time. Moving ahead. <clears throat> so, Anudvega Karam has been done. Satyam. And third is Priyam. So, what will happen, Dameshwar Mahaprabhu Prabhu, if we don't speak Priyam, if we always criticize everyone, if our speech is harsh to the ears of the listener? People won't be receptive to what we have to say, most likely. Correct. Right. And uh, not only that, but we will start taking pleasure in uh, sensationalism or we will start taking pleasure in speech, which is deliberately targeting others. And we will take vicarious pleasure in troubling other sadhus. So, there is a very nice verse about this. It is one of my personal favorite verses on this topic. Prayaha prakashatam yati malinaha sadhu badhaya nagrasishyata chedarkam Kogyasyat simhika sutam. Prayaha prakashatam yati. Usually, some people become famous. Malinaha. Sadhu badhaya. By giving trouble to other sadhus. Na grasishyata ched arkam. If Rahu would not swallow up the sun from time to time or the moon from time to time. Ko agyasyat simhika sutam. Who would come to know about the existence of Rahu? Actually, Rahu is a dark planet. So nobody would come to know about the existence of Rahu if it would not trouble the sun and the moon from time to time. So people who are apriya critics, these people from time to time, they come in limelight simply by giving trouble to other sadhus. So here is the translation. Critics and backbiters make their presence in the world felt only by giving trouble to saintly souls. Who would ever know about the existence of the dark planet Rahu if it would not give trouble to the effulgent sun by eclipsing it from time to time? So such people who always speak apriya are like Rahu, who from time to time try to become famous simply by swallowing the reputation of other sadhus. So such people live upon destroying the reputation of others. Their own reputation is built upon destroying the reputation of others. <clears throat> so such people become apriya critics. And finally, hitam. So if I speak sweetly, Dameshwar Prabhu, but if it is not to the ultimate benefit of a person, then what do you think will happen? It won't help. It won't help them. So yes, definitely it won't help them. It may sound pleasing to them in the immediate run, but in the long run, it's like feeding them actual sweets from time. If we only feed someone sweets from time to time. So that person likes it in the immediate run, but in the long run, it's not good for his health. So therefore, even with words, if we simply keep speaking sweet all the time, but these words don't benefit him, then what will happen is it will not be hitam. Ultimately, it will lead to that person falling into a very disadvantageous position in life. 
So in the Vishnu Puran, this is very clearly specified. Priyamuktam hitam naitad iti matvana tadvadet shreyas tatra hitam vachyam yadyap yatyantamat priyam. Priyam uktam, even if something is pleasing to hear, hitam na aitad. So one should not speak if it is detrimental to the interests of the listener. Iti matvana tadvadet. So one should not speak if it is not hitam, if it is detrimental to the interests of the listener. Shreyas, better, tatra hitam vachyam, better always speak that which is beneficial. Yadyapi atyantam apriyam, even if it is extremely unpleasant to the ear of the listener. So this verse specifies that if there is a conflict between priyam and hitam, between speaking sweet and speaking what is beneficial, then we should always favor what is beneficial. So these two are not mutually exclusive. It's not that, you know, whatever is beneficial has to be uh, unpleasant. It's not like that. So whatever is beneficial can also be sweet, pleasing to the ears. But if we have to make a choice between these two, then definitely we should select what is hitam, what is beneficial, even if it is at the cost of what is, if uh, at the cost of being pleasant to the ears of the listener. So we have done these four. So Anudvaika Karam Vakyam, Satyam, Priyam, Hitam. So these four are done. Now, if we have to specify all of these, then there is a very nice verse in the Mahabharat which summarizes what is controlled speech. Sometimes we try to we ensure all these four qualities in our speech, but sometimes it is not always possible. Shri Vidur knows this. Therefore, Shri Vidur gives us four levels of controlled speech. He says in the Mahabharat that there are four levels of controlled speech. Try to ensure at least one of these levels. So he says, Avyahritam vyahrita chreya ahu Satyam vadet vyahritam tadvitiyam Priyam vadet vyahritam tadvitiyam Dharmyam vadet vyahritam tadchaturtham so we can see here dvitiyam, tritiyam, chaturtham. Second level, third level, fourth level. So first line specifies first level of speech. Second line specifies second level of speech. Third line specifies third level. And fourth line specifies the fourth level of controlled speech. Avyahritam vyahrita shreya ahu. First level, level one of quality of controlled speech is to prefer silence over speaking nonsense. So better than speaking nonsense is to keep silent. Now, if at all one has to speak, then level two. The second level is Satyam Vadet Vyahrita, to at least speak the truth. Then Vidur says, third level, Priyam Vadet, is to also speak in a pleasing tone. And fourth level, Dharmyam Vadet, and to also speak that which is pertaining to Dharma, means that which is Hitam that which is beneficial, that which is coming from them. So these are four levels. And so the level one basic level is don't speak, you know, uh, as compared to speaking some nonsense. So better not to speak uh, if we have to speak nonsense. So second level is if we have to speak, then speak the truth. Uh, so then you cannot, you may not be able to ensure that it is pleasing or it is always pertaining to dharma, but at least speak the truth. Third is priyam badet. Speak the truth as well as speak it politely, speak it nicely. Fourth is speak the truth, speak nicely and speak what is dharma, what is beneficial, hitam. So these are four levels of controlled speech which Sri Vidur specifies. And this gives us the perfect balance because sometimes we may try to ensure four, all four qualities, but sometimes it may not be possible. So, what preference, so which quality should be given preference? So, the quality which should be given preference is first speak the truth, second speak sweet, third speak what is hitam. So, finally, if these are, this is the sequence in which Vidur tells us. So, if we can ensure all these four, then it is the best type of controlled speech. Other speeches are also controlled in their own respective ways. Now, as I said, 
sometimes we may not be able to speak satyam sometimes we may not be able to speak priyam sometimes we may not be able to ensure all these qualities so from time to time our speech may lack in one or more of these qualities so dhameshwar prabhu if that happens is there a way out for a devotee can a devotee do something if sometimes vacho vegam cannot be ensured on the most optimum level do you mean like if you make a mistake or it's not yeah. possible in both cases let's say it's not possible because maybe someone is a lawyer is representing a client where he has to speak some lies so some or somebody is carrying out a business and he has to speak a lie to the customer or client so especially those who are in a business they know how many lies they have to speak to their clients in order to make a good profit so sometimes it's not possible sometimes they genuinely make a mistake sometimes they lose control over their speech and they end up speaking something which they should not have spoken although they realize that it was a mistake clearly so what to do if we lose control over our speech once in a while and is there a way out for a devotee because if there is a way out then uh, the occasional mistakes not the uh, not the mistakes made on purpose but the occasional mistakes um, you know may we may have some chance of correcting them so what do you think can be done to i would say acknowledge your mistake or inability in an appropriate way if you if you spoke out of anger for example to apologize to that person and ask for their forgiveness or say if you're a lawyer and you have to lie or you're selling things you don't want to admit that in a way that uh, undermines your job so you could privately pray about it okay. so when you say privately pray about it can you elaborate more to um doing your job with the mood that um you know um this is part of my job and i have to do it just like arjuna had to fight in the war and there's some fault in the work but this is the natural work for me and so i'm offering you know my work to bhagavan and asking for forgiveness for the um discrepancies that are part of my duty wonderful prabhuji i think you have perfectly understood what can be done when speech sometimes does not have all those qualities so actually speaking speech which has all those qualities is glorious anudvega karam satyam priyam hitam there is something more glorious than that the most glorious speech is that which is directly about bhagwan shri krishna that speech is most glorious the shrimad bhagavatam um, parikshit maharaj says and shri vyas dev notes it down savagya yatasya gunan grinite actual speech is that which describes the quality of the lord so this is transcendental speech so the best thing is to ensure this speech speech that glorifies the lord or glorifies his devotees now coming back to speech in the material world in practical day to day uh, business dealings or transactions you very correctly said that if sometimes we may not be able to uh, ensure all these qualities then what we can do is we can pray to bhagwan so there should be a way of praying to bhagwan and our previous acharyas have exactly specified that there is a way of praying to bhagwan and offering all of one's speech to bhagwan so shri lajiva goswami in the bhakti sandarbha he makes a very important point he says yadrichika cheshtaya cheshtaya api bhagavad arpitatve bhagavad dharmatvam bhavati so yadrichika cheshtaya ordinary day to day activities api even those activities bhagavad arpitatve if we offer to the lord bhagavad dharmatvam bhavati they become bhagavad dharma they become devotional service when ordinary day to day activities are offered to the lord 
Rameshwar Prabhu, there is a verse in the Bhagavad Gita pertaining to this. So, do you know that verse? Yad Karoshi Arashnasi Yajuho Shirdasi Yat Pasyasi Konteya Tat Kurushva Madarpanam. Very nice. Please, please tell us the translation too. Um, whatever you do, uh, whatever you eat, um, yeah, Kurushva Arashnasi Yajuhoshi, whatever you offer, um, whatever yeah. austerities you perform, yes. uh, whatever do charity that, oh, son you of do. Kunti. Yeah. As an offering to me. Yes, very nice. Prabhu. So, Yat Karoshi, whatever you do. So, Prabhu, whatever you do, this is what I do many things which are not so good in my day to day life. Krishna is saying, Yat Karoshi, whatever you do. So, I spoke a lie. And then, is it possible to offer to Krishna, Dhameshwar Prabhu? Well, we don't want to uh, use this um use this as a excuse to cheat people or be bad and right. um, set a a poor right. example right i agree with you you know our intentions are not to use it as a license to cheat people but once in a while i lost control over one of those four qualities and maybe i ended up speaking a lie so once in a while, if it was not done out of purpose, but just out of some weakness of mine, I ended up doing so. Is it possible to offer it to Bhagavan? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So 100%, definitely, it is possible that one can offer one's activities, wholesome activities, as well as one can offer one's attachment to unwholesome activities to Bhagavan. So this is known as Sarva Karma Arpanam, offering all of one's karma to Bhagavan. And this is discussed in great detail in the Hari Bhakti Vilas. In the Hari Bhakti Vilas, Sri Sanatan Goswami recommends that one should offer all of one's activities, daily activities to Bhagavan at the end of the day. So in the Hari Bhakti Vilas, there is a verse, a mantra, specified specifically for offering all of one's activities. So Thameshwar Prabhu, would you like to learn a new mantra? I think I had this one on my wall at one point because you've shared it before. Not that one. That one was which I was taught in my childhood. But there is a hmm. mantra which Sanatan Goswami, or which Gopal Bhatta Goswami speaks in the Hari Bhakti Vilas. So, Prabhu, please repeat after me. Itaha okay. Purvam. Itaha Purvam. Prana Buddhi. Prana Buddhi. Dharma Adhikarato. Dharma Adhikarato. Jagrat. Jagrat. Swapna. Swapna. Sushupti. Sushupti. Avasthasu. Avasthasu. Manasa. Manasa. Vacha. Vacha Karmana Karmana Astabhyam Astabhyam Padbhyam Padbhyam Udarena Udarena Shishna Shishna Yat Smritam Yat Smritam Yad Uktam Yad Uktam Yat Kritam Yat Kritam Tat Sarvam Shri Krishna Arpanam Bhavatu Tat Sarvam Shri Krishna Arpanam Bhavatu Swaha, Swaha, Mam, Mam, Madiyam Cha, Madiyam Cha, Sakalam, Sakalam, Haraye, Haraye, Samarpayami, Samarpayami, T. Om Tat Sat. Om Tat Sat. Okay. So, Itaha Purvam, uh, previously, Prana buddhi dharma adhikarato, in accordance with the facilities provided to me by my life force, prana, buddhi, my intelligence, and dharma, my prescribed dharma. Whatever I have previously remembered, hmm, yat smritam, uttered, yat uktam, and executed, yat kritam, through my mind, manasa, words, vacha, working senses, karmana, Hands, hastabhyam, 
लेग्स पद्भ्याम बेली उदरेण एंड जेनिटल्स शिशना वट एवर आई हैव डन थ्रू ऑल दी सेंसेस इन द अवेकंड स्टेट ड्रीमिंग स्टेट और डीप स्लीप स्टेट इन ऑल दी स्टेट तत्सर्व श्री कृष्णार्पणम मे ऑल ऑफ दैट बी एन ऑफरिंग अन टू कृष्ण माम मदीयम च आई ऑफर माई सेल्फ एज वेल एज एवरीथिंग बिलोंगिंग टू मी हर ये समर्पया मी आई ऑफर अन टू हरी ओम तत्सत इज भगवान श्री कृष्ण हिमसेल्फ प्रेजेंट इन द फॉर्म ऑफ दीज थ्री टर्म्स सो प्रभु दिस इज अ मंत्र विच इज गिवन इन द हरी भक्ति विलास विच आर इज रिकमेंडेड फॉर द डिवोटीज फॉर सर्व कर्म अर्पणम ऑफरिंग ऑल स्पीच टू भगवान श्री कृष्ण the best speech is that which is directly related to krishna so that is transcendental speech but for all other speech whether it was pious or if it sometimes did not fit all the criteria of being pious controlled speech all of that speech should be offered at the end of the day to bhagwan so what i had shown you previously what was a shortened version of this uh, but this is the elaborate mantra given by shri gopal bhatta goswami in the hari bhakti vilas so it is in the 8th vilas 8th chapter this is mantra 410 so devotees who are interested can look up this verse this mantra in the hari bhakti vilas and this is one way of ensuring that whatever speech we spoke we tried our best to control it but sometimes if we could not ensure all aspects of vachovegam still we offered our speech to bhagwan and by offering our speech to bhagwan what happens is this becomes known as karma arpanam and therefore the negative effects of sp- such speech do not come to us but this should not be used as a license to speak you know, any nonsense speech or to speak harsh words to others so this should not be used as a license shri jiva goswami says if one uses this as a license it becomes kaitava bhakti kaitava means bhakti which is cheating and then it will not result in the ultimate benefit of the devotee so this is offering not only speech but all activities of one's day to bhagwan shri krishna so if this is done then we can try to ensure that vacho vegam is ensured to as good a degree as possible in our day to day lives so this is not simply some uh high sounding philosophy but what we can do in our practical day to day lives when sometimes we are not able to control our walk our speech sometimes even great personalities may not be able to control their speech so what to speak of ordinary personalities like myself sometimes i too may not be able to control my speech therefore since i am an ordinary person i should have some practical way of trying to ensure that if my speech doesn't always live up to the standard of proper speech then what can i do will bhakti devi save me in such situations and the answer is yes as long as i do not make it a license to speak harsh words to other devotees so with this i would like to pause today's session i would like to conclude with a quote from shrila prabhupad so prabhu you can kindly read this quote Lord Krishna says all these activities your work your charity your eating your penance and your rituals everything should be done for me that's all that is krishna consciousness everything should be done for if you want to work well work day and night but you work for krishna that is krishna consciousness thank you prabhu ji thank you everyone yadatra skaritam kinchit vidvam saha purayantu tat yadatra saushtavam kinchit tad guru re vame nahi yadatra khalitam kinchit if there was any mistake in what i spoke vidvamsa you are all learned devotees purayantu tat so please you know do not turn away from me nowadays there is a very uh, sad tendency in the world outside that if we do not like one word uttered by somebody then we cut off all communication with them so this culture in today's world is not very healthy for one opinion that we do not like we try to cancel out a person so this is not good if yadatras khalitam kinchit if anything that was spoken was incorrect purayantu tat please come out and fill the gaps yadatras saushtavam kinchit but if you liked anything 
even a single slide or a single verse or a single word or a single alphabet or a single syllable. So please remember Tat Guru Reva. It belongs to my Guru Janas, my Diksha Guru, my Shiksha Gurus, who are all the disciples of Srila Prabhupada, all the God Brothers of Srila Prabhupada, all the Gaudiya Vaishnavas from all the Parivars that have existed in the past, in the future, and who are existing in the present, including all of you. You are also my Gurus. So it belongs to you. Me nahi. It doesn't belong to me. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada ki jai. Hare Krishna. Do you have time for questions? Probably? Yes. yes. Okay. So now Our we first have... question is from Saurabh Sharma. I can ask here, Prabhu, if you permit me. Yes. Okay. So, uh, you know, with this class, I'm inspired to ask you further clarification about a pastime with Srila Rupa Goswami and uh, uh, Rupa Narayan, who challenged him on one of his verse in Vrindavan. So Rup Goswami didn't give any clarification and accepted like whatever you are saying is correct and find the document accept, accepting defeat. So this communication was preem. It wasn't agitating to Rup Narayan, but it wasn't truthful and it was not hitam for Rup Narayan. This instigated uh, agitated basically uh, Jiva Goswami. So the communication of uh, Rup uh, Goswami basically agitated uh, Jeev Goswami who confronted uh, you know Rup Narayan and corrected him which agitated eventually like you know Rup Narayan and now he's coming this agitated Rup Goswami. So this dynamic of Vacho Vegam among elevated Acharya. Uh, can you shed some light on this? Like how to understand this? All right. Especially so then, the, this verse itself is coming from Rupa Goswami. Right. And this pastime, I think, is, uh, you know, a core reason we got this Granth. Very nice. So, Srila Rupa Goswami, when he was confronted by the scholar who challenged the verse of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Srila Rupa Goswami preferred not to say anything. So, as I said, I had shown, uh, you know, Vidura's uh, levels of controlled speech. One thing is to not say anything. Level one is to not say anything. There is also a verse in the Bhagavatam which says that whatever opinions other people give. So, one can optionally just say okay to them. So, I call this the okay man verse. You, you shouldn't become the yes man or the no man. Sometimes you need to be the okay man. So, because this verse I have spoken quite a few number of times. This is 7.14.6 Sriman Bhagavatam. Gyatayaha pitara putra bhrataraha Suhrido apare yad vadanti yad ichanti cha anumodeta nirmama. So, an intelligent man in human society should make his own program of activities very simple. So, if there are suggestions, see, giving suggestions is free, and people have ample time for giving free suggestions. So, people come with whatsoever is agitating them in their mind, and then they end up giving free suggestions, unsolicited suggestions. So the first thing is Srila Rupa Goswami did not ask this scholar for any suggestion. And then he came and gave an unsolicited suggestion to Rupa Goswami, I will correct your literature. So the initial Vacho Vegam is from the side of this scholar, basically. And Rupa Goswami then said, all right. Uh, so if there are any suggestions from friends, children, parents, brothers, anyone else. So he should externally agree, saying, yes, that's okay. So, <laughs> okay, man. But internally, he should be determined not to create a cumbersome life in which the purpose of life will not be fulfilled. So, Srila Rupa Goswami knew that this person is a confrontationalist, if there is such a word. So, this person is a confrontationalist. And if I, if he doesn't find a fault in this verse, 
most likely he will study my literature even deeper with the sole intention of finding faults so that will you know increase the confrontation therefore the best way is anumodeta yes that is okay shrupa goswami just said okay that's okay you can find a fault with the literature if you want but then shrila jiva goswami instead of communicating the issue with shrila rupa goswami he directly went and spoke to the scholar so that was the issue not that shrila rupa goswami's controlled speech was the issue shrila rupa goswami's speech was never uncontrolled shrila rupa goswami's speech was always adhering to the standards of shastra but it was shri jiva goswami who instead of asking shrila rupa goswami about it he directly went and confronted this scholar that is where the issue started if shrila jiva goswami would not have confronted this scholar what would have happened is the scholar would have gone away forgotten about it public memory is anyway short and nobody would have come to know about it but shrila jiva goswami instead of consulting shrila rupa goswami he directly consulted this scholar so that is where the uh, the vachyo vegam sort of began and shrila rupa goswami also later while correcting jiva goswami he did not use very harsh words i had specified the words apakarini chet kope if you become angry at people who hurt you become angry at your own anger because it is your own anger which is hurting you the most so that is the answer to your query bro i hope it satisfies you thank you next we have renda sundari hi krishna prabhu um prabhu i was wondering about um it seems like it's a little easier when one's maybe doing business to separate that from to make it like a different category and understand the circumstance but when we're maybe having relationships with devotees that include business or say like management at a temple so one is interacting with devotees and so i've been given the advice that to be diplomatic but it seems like diplomatic starts to become a gray area where it like gets into diplomacy and so it's it's it seems like a riskier zone so are there is there more implication when we when we're in that realm interacting with devotees versus when we're doing business and it's just clear like i'm just doing this to make money for my livelihood right so um i'll try to rephrase the question so when we are trying to do business it's very clear that we have to indulge in speaking lies from time to time because that's the nature of business but when we are with devotees especially devotee relationships so how do we try to ensure that our devotee relationships are not affected by the lies that we speak is that what you are trying to ask mm-hmm. yeah yes. okay so there is a nice verse about friendships and this also applies to devotee friendships icche chet vipulam maitrim trini tatra na karayet vagvadam arth sambandham tat patni paribhashanam so when it comes to friendships there are three things which one should not do i will try to find this verse also meanwhile i'm recollecting it from memory so there are three things which one should ensure not to do in a relationship especially in a relationship with a friend first is vagvadam vagvadam is getting into any sort of argument second is artha sambandham then trying to get into a financial relationship and third is tat patni paribhashanam and trying to speak to the spouse of your friend when the friend is not present these three things are a potential disaster for every relationship especially between friends vagvadam artha sambandham tat patni paribhashanam so this is a very 
like this is a simple uh, subhashit verse and i will try to show you where i had quoted this because uh, this verse is from subhashit ratna bhandagaram and in one of the uh, notes that i compiled on facebook i had shared this verse so i am showing this verse it's in front of us ichchet vipulam maitrim trini tatra nakarayet vagvadam artha sambandham tat patni paribhashanam if you desire abundant long lasting friendships then do not perform the following three acts first is trying to win an argument against a friend especially in public vagvadam second is artha sambandham try not to enter into any sort of financial contracts or business deals with the friend and third is tat patni paribhashanam try not to flirt with their spouse especially when they are not present when they are present also one should not flirt but especially try not to speak in a solitary place with their spouse when they are not present so this is something which will help us a lot in ensuring that our devotee relationships are not spoiled so i hope this sheds some light on the query that you asked yeah yeah that's helpful for me i think also for being in temple management then it's like another category yeah. that i find difficult too but this is yeah especially the financial part yeah right so it's so there's a clear indication not to enter into any sort of financial dealings the six goswamis never had any financial dealings amongst themselves absolutely no financial dealings amongst themselves so that's a good example to follow and um, uh, i and as and when we are in the management we have been authorized and empowered to do some things which otherwise a devotee who is not in the management is not allowed to do so as long as we are not abusing the rights which have been given to us that should still be okay but a devotee who is into services of management should be especially very careful because one slight mistake and uh, you know it can hurt us spiritually as well as it can hurt our relationships so i hope this shed some light thank you thank you next we have mohit deshmukh Hare Krishna, Prabhuji, and the back end of the long. Sometimes what happened? I spoke harshly to my parents, and it is not pleasing to them. So, uh, for some topics like on bhakti, yeah, for a final like my uh, career about career. So, how can I uh, like control my speech to avoid this speaking right. harshly? All right. So sometimes. we end up speaking harshly even to our own parents and you said you said about yourself but i'll take it upon myself maybe let's say sometimes if i speak harshly to my parents then what should i do if i am affected by the fault of speaking harshly to my parents what should i do so in the shrimad bhagavatam shri krishna has said specifically that one should try to serve his parents i will show you a verse from the shrimad bhagavatam where krishna has given a direct instruction about service to the parents this is from 10th canto chapter number 45 this is verse number 5 i will show you this verse by sharing my screen it's a very nice verse this was when krishna met you know uh, devaki and vasudev sarvarth sambhavo deho janitah poshito yatah न तयोर याति निर्वेशम पित्रोर मर्त्य शतायुषा सो मोहित प्रभु यू योर सेल्फ कैन रीड द ट्रांसलेशन प्लीज रीड बाय अनम्यूटिंग योर सेल्फ विथ वन्स बॉडी वन कैन एक्वायर ऑल गोल्स ऑफ लाइफ एंड इट इज वन्स पेरेंट्स टू गिव द बॉडी बर्थ एंड सस्टेनेंस सस्टेनेंस देयरफॉर नो मॉर्टल मैन कैन रिपे हिज डेब्ट टू हिज पेरेंट्स इवन इफ ही सर्व्स देम फॉर अ फुल लाइफ टाइम ऑफ अ हंड्रेड इयर्स ऑलराइट नॉट ओनली दिस The next verse. Yes, the your atma jah kalpa atma na cha dhane na cha vrittim na dadya tam pratya swa mamsam khada yanti hi. Please read. A son, though able to do so, 
fails to provide for his parents with his physical resources and wealth is forced after his death to eat his own flesh this is please don't become afraid uh, uh, there is still chance time to correct our course if we have not done so till now so in general with our parents we should behave nicely but whenever parents start opposing one's bhajan then one should be polite yet firm polite yet firm and if the parents are just giving some unsolicited suggestions you should do this you should do that mohit they they might be calling you mohit so mohit you should do this mohit you should do that so i showed the previous verse anumodeta just be an okay man you don't have to take it very seriously if it is against your bhajan so if they give an opinion mohit you should earn at least a lakh rupees per month so mohit prabhu what will you say tell me i will earn like when it may come out it may like zarurat no you didn't you didn't learn the verse if they tell you you have to earn a lakh rupees a month they give you a suggestion according to the shrimad bhagavatam you should say okay what should you say okay theek okay. hai and but then you should do what is favorable for your bhajan i hope you are able to understand that saying okay will stop the argument there itself that is what will be helpful for your bhajan later whatever is actually helpful for your bhajan in consultation with your seniors and gurujanas that you should do but never at the cost of disrespecting the opinions of the parents so whenever the parents give a strong opinion we have to say one thing what should we say mohit prabhu okay that's okay all. okay not a single word after okay i hope it is clear <laughs> yes prabhu that that will avoid that will help you avoid a lot of the conflicts hari okay. krishna next omkar prabhu hari krishna prabhu ji dhanat pranam my pranam uh, so ji uh, regarding uh, this arup siddha bhakti uh, the point where you uh, mentioned that you can offer everything we say to krishna generally what happens is with friends we may have some joking words or just uh, plain just speaking so such type of speech can also be offered as arup siddha bhakti but the point is the arup siddha bhakti is meant just for uh, some time of use like it should not uh, Uh, i mean uh, not be more or it actually stop after some time so is it that a uh, uttam adhikari will stop speaking or behave like a mute person after is like focusing only on pure devotional service because the nature of the material world is that it is generally that we will speak something so how to understand this point as long as you are interacting with the world outside you will need to offer your speech to bhagwan i hope you are able to understand uh, unless you are a renunciate baba ji who has become a bhajana nandi closed himself in a bhajan kutir and doing only bhajan and not interacting with the world outside so there is definitely you will have to interact with the world outside especially if you are in the grihastha ashram and for the in our society if you are also in the brahmachari ashram in our iskon society because the brahmacharis they have to interact with people outside the brahmacharis there is uh, traditionally a brahmachari stays in the forest and studies the vedas and doesn't interact much with the society but nowadays what is happening is the brahmachari has to interact much more with the society i hope you are able to understand yes, <laughs> yes. so even if it is a brahmachari hmm? and jay dwarka prabhu is smiling so even if it is a brahmachari huh? and he because he has to interact a lot with the society outside in today's age therefore as long as you are interacting with the society outside and you are speaking a few things to them you know that uh, are not necessarily devotional you have no other way but to offer all of it to bhagwan the day somebody becomes a bhajananandi and says now only my bhajan now nothing else then they become quiet towards the world outside like jad bharat they don't speak then they can then they don't need to indulge in arup siddha bhakti so i hope that makes it clear yes true and there was one second question uh, prabhu ji in the slides uh, can you take it back to the uh, point where vidur ji was uh, speaking about the four levels of speech right i'll do that 
So this is the yes, same. Bro. Yes, bro. Uh, bro. In this the uh, second one, speaking truth, and the third one, speaking truth along with pleasing words. Right. It seems the same because, like for example, we may say that uh, you are not good at singing. Example. Hmm. a person may say oh your singing is not that good or you may say you are singing very worst so it seems that these two things are the same so why can't a person directly follow the third instruction why do we need a second level so let me understand the question why does a yes, person sir. need to follow the second level that is to speak the truth yes bro yes why not, when he why can not? actually yes huh? See, first thing is don't speak. Level one, if you instead of speaking some nonsense, don't speak. Second, if you have to speak, at least speak the truth. But in speaking the truth, you may sometimes compromise qualities such as speaking pleasing. I hope you are able to understand. So, level two is you speak the truth, although it may not be pleasing. Level three is not only do you speak the truth, but you also make it pleasing to hear. Okay. Instead so of we saying, need the skill. We need yeah, the skill obvious, to make the obviously. truth. We, yeah, obviously. Okay. So instead of saying that your singing is the worst, like in, and if, for example, if I don't like, it, if I don't like somebody singing, I'm just giving a hypothetical example. Suppose if I don't like your singing, and I come to you and say, Omkar Prabhu, this was the worst that I ever heard in my life. So that's that may be the truth, maybe, but that's not Priyam. And definitely, my speech is not very good, and it needs to be controlled. So, better than that is to say that Omkar Prabhu, you sung Kirtan today, and uh, your attempt was certainly nice. And at the same time, if you allow me, I would like to give a suggestion. Then, if you allow me to give a suggestion, then I'll say maybe Prabhu, if there's a nice music class where they teach how to, you know. Tune your voice also, so your kirtan will be much better than what it is right now. So, would you like to, you know, are you interested in learning how to improve your voice? So, how does that sound? That would be good. Yeah, that would be good. So, see, I convinced you. Yes. No, no. All right. Could I add a small point there too? Yes, Prabhu. This there's a distinction between fact and opinion. Right. It's not a matter of fact that someone's a good or bad singer. It's a matter of opinion. Right. Definitely. 100%. So it's, uh, it's not always objective truth. It's sometimes subjective truth, basically. That you know, subject from uh, person to person. That who's the one perceiving Omkar Prabhu's speech? You know, so maybe Omkar Prabhu singing maybe is is not so good maybe my opinion but may not be somebody else's opinion still but in my opinion that is the truth if that is my truth Umkar Prabhu singing <laughs> is not still if it is my truth it should follow certain guidelines that is what the verse is trying to say my truth <laughs> yes <laughs> okay. all right um Jai Dwarka Prabhu Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Pram. Thank you once again for such an enlightening session. I would say that your sessions are always like that. Uh, you leave very little space for uh, confusion or lack of clarity. Your presentations are always crystal clear. And uh, if any room is there, that also you very precisely and accurately answering your queries. And thank you so much, Oji, for such wonderful uh, presentation. And your this is amazing, Prabhuji. I, I, I had is I, I hope this is Priyam. I hope it is Satyam Prabhu. All right. <laughs> yes, so the, it, it, it okay. contains all the four uh, in still dharma. As okay. per, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Prabhu. Yes, please, please go ahead. Prabhuji? Yeah, yeah, please. I had a question from previous session, Prabhuji. Yeah. Yes, uh, Prabhuji, as we studied that shloka Anu Dwega Karam Vakyam, in that purpose, Shla Prabhupada is telling that one should not speak to those who are not one's uh, students. Mm -hmm. Um. A teacher should only speak to those who are students, uh, and otherwise that person will would agitate others. So, Roji, my question in uh, this case was there: uh, being in temple generally, what it happens many times is that uh, when we are in management, also then sometimes we have to take decision uh, regarding people, uh, those who are not our students. At the same time, 
uh, those who we may not have relationship with also and uh, there are such people also who do not who do not accept uh, uh, guidance from anyone they are just serving so we just keep them somehow so for them also we have to take decision we have to correct them also so right. proji i think then this will violate that principle then how to uh, how to balance this uh, this thing hmm. all right so in a vaishnav society especially from a management point of view because when we are managing an institution so sometimes there are some people whom we have to correct but who are not exactly our disciples so we'll i will go back to the verse where what prabhupad was saying so what prabhupad was saying is a guru should not speak a guru should not speak to uh, people who are not his disciples but that was specifically regarding harsh speech basically let's go back to the purport okay and let's try to see what shri prabhupad was saying because uh, i am sure it is indicated there and i'll share my screen with you this is 17.15 see one should not speak in such a way as to agitate the mind of others very clearly it's about agitation agitating others the one should not speak in such a way as to agitate the mind of others of course when a teacher speaks he can speak the truth proper doesn't me add the term agitating here but of it's carrying on from the previous sentence he can speak the truth for the instruction of his students but a teacher should not speak to those who are not his students if he will agitate their mind so there is a big if here if he will agitate their minds so that should be taken into consideration so if somebody is not our student we can still speak to them provided we don't agitate them all right i hope you are able to understand we can speak to them now in a management now as you said i am coming back to it in a management scenario so there has to be a basic principle accepted by everyone what is the basic principle that has to be accepted by everyone this principle is specified in krishna bhajan amritam by shri narhari sarkar so the principle is sarve vaishnava guravah basically all vaishnavas are in some or the other way our gurus this is i will try to show this sentence that in all ways some uh, in in some way all vaishnavas are our gurus so if all vaishnavas are our gurus then uh, definitely uh, on some level of authority every vaishnava has so if every vaishnava has some, some certain level of authority so that level of authority should be given to that particular vaishnava so i am trying to yes here i am showing you the quote from narhari sarkar you only please read it prabhu what he says yes please i have highlighted sakala sakala vaishnava eva guravah yeah you please translate you know you know what this means yes please all the vaishnavas uh, are certainly our gurus yes so you also tra- i have translated the same all vaishnavas are certainly gurus <laughs> yes please. now so the management should impress this point upon all the devotees that it's not that who are you to tell me it's not like that we are somebody to tell you sakala vaishnava eva gurava all vaishnavas are in some way our gurus but the management devotees have a certain adhikar certain limited right and that limited right is within the framework of the management of the temple so if a certain devotee is doing something which is causing a disturbance to the management of the temple then the management has a right to step in and say that you are interfering in our adhikar therefore we need to instruct you here i hope you are able to understand Yes, so that so that adh- that adhikar which the management definitely has, but if a Vaishnav has some personal opinion which is not interfering with anybody else and which is not you know causing a disturbance in the management, it's not such a big thing. And that should like some Vaishnav has an opinion that in order to advance in bhakti, one should study Vedanta Sutra. Now he is not communicating it to others; he has his personal opinion. When somebody asks him, he gives that opinion, not otherwise. So he should be allowed yes. to keep that opinion. because it's not causing a big disturbance in the management i hope you are able to understand so differences of opinion should be tolerated some tolerance should be there but if it starts becoming a big disturbance in the management then the management should step in not that the management should micromanage each and every little thought 
thought policing should not be there because thought policing is what drives devotees away from devotional service micromanagement of each and every thought there is a term used in a novel called as 1984 this term is called as thought crime so the management should not define what are thought crimes i hope you are able to understand because the devotee is keeping it to himself so that is yes yes thank you so much Paul. thank you so much Hare krishna okay i'm just going by the order of who's on the top on the right so yeah. forgive me if i've um been ignorant of any um seniority but uh next we'll call on parama karuna prabhu Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. I first of all wholeheartedly second uh, Jay Dwarka Prabhu's uh, what he mentioned about how nicely and succinctly you explain and leaving no room for any confusion. Thank you so much, as always. Thank you, Prabhu. Uh, uh, my, I had a different question, but uh, a more important sort of a question came up out of the Q and A which was uh, these uh, three points about how not to spoil devotee relationship and the financial dealing aspect. Right. And if some, uh, you know, if we help some devotee out of our own desire by, in a financial means, he may not have asked, but we see that, you know, that may help him. And we do some help in that way without expecting anything. It's just one way, done, nothing else. Uh, is that also a come under the financial relationship or the cause of spoiling? And the reason I'm asking the subtlety here is that it may cause, I feel, a little bit of feeling of... Uh, Some, yes. Some some feeling of uh, that I have taken something for on the other devotee, hmm. and then he may it may he may not be able to fully express himself to us, and it, it may cause some kind of unsaid, hmm. little right. bit up and down. I'm little. I'm give. I gave you accepted. Right. It still may cause, even though our intention is very purely to give and forget, purely to help. But if we don't do that to keep the relationship 50-50 completely, then mm. we end up not helping the, our friend, our close friend who we want to help. Exactly. So, let me just rephrase it so that devotees will also, uh, at least I, you can say if I have the correct idea of what you asked. When we are especially in in financial transactions let's say if we give to a certain devotee in order to help them and our aim is not to do a favor upon them we just gave it unconditionally but that devotee may feel pressurized that because you gave therefore my hands are lower i am accepting your hands are above you are giving so in sanskrit this is called uttamarna the giver adhamarna the taker because the taker's hands are always like this the acceptor's hands are always like this. So therefore, he has to accept a lower position. And therefore, he may not be, be the relationship may not no longer be the same of equality because he has accepted something from you. That's what you're asking, right? Hmm? Perfectly, perfectly stated. All right. So very clear. When we, when we give to somebody, we should add a statement that I am giving this unconditionally without any expectations and expecting more friendship from you. That's all. While giving, we should make these statements. I am giving unconditionally without any expectations. The only expectation I have is more friendship from you. That's all. So my my Shiksha Guru, uh, Sri Srimad Dor Govind Swami Maharaj, when he was in his Grihastha Ashram, one point of time, a relative asked for a loan of rupees 500 from him. So 500 in those days was a big amount. So he gave 500 rupees. And six months passed and he's not asking it back. So Maharaj was in his Purva Ashram. So his wife from his Purva Ashram, she started asking him, when are you going to ask it back? 
So Maharaj said, I know his nature, he is not going to give it back. Therefore, I have given it as charity without any expectations. So that person never gave it back. <laughs> but Maharaj also never asked it back. So when we give money in a Vaishnava society, if at all we give money, the most ideal way of giving money is to give it as charity without any expectations and with no strings attached to the money that we give. Sometimes we give a donation and that donation has some strings attached to it. That should not be the case. Because when we give, there is a charity in the mode of goodness. Without the feeling of upakar. Without the feeling that I have done some favor upon somebody else. So that is that verse can be studied. That should be a, our mood in giving. I hope that clarifies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sadananda Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Danvat Pranam Prabhuji. I want to ask a question about like my daily life event happened today. Like today I visited doctor and he watched my Tulsi Mala and he started saying that you are in uh, spirituality in so much short age. And he was like started saying this bhakti and always like starting stage of God. After that, we have to forget God and go for something higher. Like he was into Advait philosophy that I can understand that they, are, they have that philosophy. You know, like first you have to worship God. And we have to forget the God and go towards the moksha. And then he was telling about that things and all, explaining right. me. In such situations, what we should do? Like, we should counterly fight them or just be silent. Like, okay, okay, take the medicines and go away. Yeah. So, you are in a peculiar situation here because you are taking a medicine from a doctor. And if you argue with him and defeat him, he may end up giving the incorrect medicine to you, Prabhu. So from a practicality point of view, it is better to take the medicine first and then argue with him. I hope you are able to understand. If at all you have to argue with him, first take your medicine. After you have taken your medicine, then if you are capable, are we capable of arguing with them? That we should also, we should also judge if we are capable of arguing with them. Because we can argue from a n number of n points of view, but we should have the skill to argue politely and on the basis of Shastra. So, for example, if you are a follower of Shri Madhvacharya, then you can very easily use a surgical knife against all his arguments, basically. But you need to learn all those arguments from Shri Madhvacharya. That how do you argue against, how do you argue from Shastra? against impersonalism so let's you know <clears throat> uh, Sri Madhavacharya for example gives a very simple you know argument the impersonalists say that Jagat Mithya everything in the world is false so Sri Madhavacharya asks a question is this statement true or false the statement that you just made that the world is false is that statement true or false so, if that statement is true, that the statement Jagat Mithya is true, then there is something besides the world which is true. Basically, there, huh? the entire world is not false. One statement in the world has become true. So, that claim of Jagat Mithya becomes false. And if that statement itself is false, Jagat Mithya is also false. Then the whole premise of Mayavad falls down. So, we should learn how to argue, Prabhu. I mean... But take your medicine first and then if you have the capability to argue politely in a way which doesn't hurt him. Also, the age of the person who is in front of us also matters. Sometimes see they are elder to us. Especially when they are elder to us, you can just say okay and leave. That's all. That, that's what you can do. And maybe sometime later you can give them a book. Let the book argue against him. So, it's some, some of these things can be done. But uh, if the person is willing to accept your arguments, if you are of a similar age uh, and if he is willing to accept your argument and if you have the capability to argue, then by all means you can argue politely uh, based on Shastra. 
argue politely based on shastra that is what uh, vad it is called vad in discussions it is called vad argue politely on the basis of shastra for arriving at the truth so that is what it is i hope this satisfies you prabhu ji i also wanted to talk on jagan mitya like i have heard that the feeling of me and minus this uh, like mitya it's illusion like the world we make of mine this is my world this is my things so that is mitya and everything present in that world like this things are real but the feelings you are attached with that are uh, like imaginary is that right way no of thinking that jagan mitya no the uh, mayavadi's advaitavadi's point of view is not only is the world false but you are also your identity is also false your feelings are also false everything is false that is the advaitavadi's idea of mithya so if somebody is giving you this other idea of mithya they are not representing advaitavad correctly they should represent their own philosophy correctly <laughs> their philosophy which i am not telling of advaitavad i am saying that according to vaishnav siddhant is it right to say like this me and my thing is false it's not false is it really no it is temporary your current identity is temporary and in the temporary for the temporary time that it exists it is true but it is not permanent and therefore it is ultimately false so that is the vaishnav siddhant so then everything is false no ultimately ultimately everything in the material world is temporary and hence in the ultimate sense is false okay yeah and prabhu ji i have heard if we do bhakti like full day like 24 hours i have heard anarth nivritti happens then if we do arup siddha bhakti swarup siddha bhakti sam siddha bhakti all three then only anarth nivritti happens or all only swarup siddha bhakti we do 24 hours then the anarth nivritti happens anarth nivritti happens by bhagwan's mercy it doesn't happen by a specific formula because sometimes it is not possible to do 24 hours bhajan 8 hours anyways people sleep so 6 hours at least good sadhakas sleep at least 6 hours so 24 hours is not possible shrila vishwanath chakravarti thakur has said in his commentary to bhakti rasamrit chindu rupa goswami is making a he is saying a verse always remember krishna never forget krishna vishwanath chakravarti thakur says always means once a day minimum all what does always mean he, de, he redefines always what does always mean minimum once a day i say i added minimum please don't make it maximum uh, always means minimum once a day so that's how he redefined always so 24 hours doesn't literally mean 24 hours every time because it is not possible for a new sadhaka but for an advanced sadhaka it may be possible 24 hours a day shila prabhupad once said that i can teach you how to dream about krishna and how to chant hari krishna even in your sleep that may be possible for an advanced sadhaka but not for a new sadhaka for a new sadhaka 24 hours means minimum once a day i hope you know that makes it clear so we should we, when we go to a gymnasium to a gym we should lift as much as we can lift huh, while maintaining our health so if we try to lift too much on the first day then there may not be a second day so therefore uh, the acharyas have redefined for us what 24 hours means So, Prabhu, did you remember Krishna once today? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. So, you remember 24 hours? Congratulations, <laughs> Prabhu. That's your... Okay, Prabhu. Next, we'll Prabhu. go to Bhakti's Thank iPhone. Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Uh, thank you so much again, as always. Wonderful uh, class. Um... I have, I want for clarity on the word okay. So okay. I feel okay is really a gray area because I say yes and no, that is black and white. Okay is gray. At okay. work constantly, manager will say, will you do this? Okay. Like we don't generally tend to say yes. If parents, if as a pa parent, I would ask my child something and they would say, okay, I am, it's more, more towards yes. Okay really more towards yes than really meaning gray area or no. 
So how do you help uh, understand speaking the truth, uh, but trying to be like, how do, how, how do you explain to, a, the world doesn't understand okay as a gray area. So how do we understand this basically in our day-to-day -day life? <clears throat> right. See, the words said <clears throat> anumodeta. Anumodeta means you externally agree with what they are saying, although you may not internally agree with them. <clears throat> so in India, in a sense, not in India, in the world outside, everywhere in the world outside, there is yes. You know, if you look at me, how do you how do you say yes? So you say yes like this. Uh, you can look at my face. That is how you say yes. And when mm. you say no, you say like this, no. All right. And mm. there is an okay, which happens only in India. And that is like <laughs> this. You might have seen. Okay. Yes, All right. So will you do this, Seva? Okay. Will you do this thing? Okay. So that, you know what that means. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that attitude originates here in India. That okay, so Shastra is asking you, it is asking you to not always say the complete truth, especially in situations which are not favorable for your bhajan. Please try to understand this. Shastra is yeah. asking you to be slightly diplomatic in situations which are not favorable for your bhajan. The way to do so is to say. Yeah, okay. Definitely, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely try to look into it. You know, that's what, that's the, that's the ideal answer. Yeah, okay, I'll definitely okay. try to look into it. And uh, that's what I, that's what my standard reply to every WhatsApp message is. Yeah, okay, I'll definitely try to look into it. And then, uh, you know, 20 days later, that person still hasn't received a reply from me. <laughs> thank you Prabhuji for that clarity that's awesome thank you <laughs> I, I clarified a point which is based on vagueness see. so that is uh, and yet it has truth in it because when you say yes I will try my best you are giving some clarity and it is true you are not saying yes you are saying I will try so that is still truth to it so I really love that thank you so much <laughs> yeah so it's speaking lies in a truthful way that's what Let's put it that way. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Ravaji. All right. All right. Should we wrap up there? Okay. So thank you very much once again, all the devotees who are kindly present here. Thank you, Dhameshwar Mahaprabhu Prabhu for kindly hosting and organizing the session. Today, we learned something about diplomacy, about saying okay. And uh, hopefully, whatever was presented today will not be misused by anyone i have already told that it is not for these principles are not for abusing um, the limited freedom that has been given to us the acharyas have given us limited freedom with the hope that we will not abuse it and the acharyas could have restricted all our freedom but they gave us limited freedom with the great hope that we will not abuse it so i hope that all of us will keep this in mind thank you so much dear devotees Jagat Guru Shila Prabhupad ki jai. Shila Rupa Guru Shila ki jai. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Hari Parashat Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Give a big Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna Prabhu. 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 Hare Krishna Prabhu